Welcome to the Authority of Love, where our desire is for every life and relationship to be built on the love and lordship of Jesus Christ. My name is Greg Williams. I'm your host, and thanks again for joining us on this broadcast or podcast, or video, or however you may be listening. I hope you were able to catch yesterday's message, as it is one that is so often misunderstood, wrongly taught, and applied, and it's rife with danger and deceptions on both sides of the message. It was entitled The Temple of the Holy Spirit and was about what salvation looks like as it is lived out in a disciple of Christ's life. Salvation is God's free gift, but our faith must show by our actions, our lives, our relationships, even in our thoughts and motives and desires, according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that Christ is on the throne of our lives and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. That's the only way we can actually test those things and make sure we're doing it every time. In our flesh, we can't. But when the Holy Spirit dwells in us because Christ is Savior and Lord, then that comes through, or it should. We're all at different levels of maturity, so we must give grace and freedom for all to grow, as well as walking in accountability and discipline to see that it's happening in our lives and helping others do the same. If this is not happening, then we... We, are, we must ask the question, did you actually receive Christ's free gift? This is what James is saying when he says that our works prove that we have faith. Faith without works is dead. No faith. All right. If you missed yesterday or any other messages, you can find them at love and lordship, love, A-N-D, lordship.com. And you'll find our book there. There's an icon of the front uh, cover there in the middle of the homepage. Uh, you could give if you're feeling led to do that. Thank you for, for do, so doing. Um, you can find, again, the articles, the podcast, and the videos there on tabs as well. If you have a question or a comment, like to contact me, please do so by email at loveandlordship at gmail.com. Love, A-N-D, lordship at gmail.com. Now, as I mentioned in the opening of yesterday's episode, today's message is one that I know we all love to hear and obediently follow. Repentance. Please don't change the dial, turn off the radio, or shut down the podcast or video, okay? If you've been following at any point uh, throughout the year, you know that these messages are powerful, often convicting, and because they are aligned with God's Word, they are also very liberating if we will listen and be obedient to God's Word. Repentance is one of those words so often gets whitewashed, watered down, or literally changed so folks feel better about themselves when we actually need to understand and align ourselves with God and His Word and through Christ by repentance. By the way, contrary to much of today's teachings or lack thereof, repentance is not just a one-time thing. It is required ongoing as we grow and walk out that faith and grace that has saved us and as we mature as followers or disciples of Christ. Chambers begins with one of the most needed and abused texts in all of Scripture to introduce this title and topic of repentance. Now, if you're following along in the devotional booklet or online at myutmost.org, we are on December the 7th, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, right? So we want to remember that as well. And thanks to all those who have given their lives or families that have made that sacrifice or just given their service to our country uh, to help protect our freedoms and our rights. Most of us, if we've been in church much at all in our lives, have heard the definition of repentance as something along the lines as changing directions, doing a 180, or turning your life around. Maybe you've heard a little more about repentance as changing your lifestyle or way of living, running from the old life into the new life, or possibly even changing your way of thinking. Right? All of these have some degree of validity in defining repentance as it is used in Scripture and what it should mean and how we should apply it in our lives. But we probably do ourselves a favor if we combine some of these definitions, bring them together in order to gain and better and more fully understand what it means in our lives as believers and disciples of Christ. The Greek word most often used for repentance is metanoia. which By the way, the word picture for metanoia is the, the, the cocoon that has the caterpillar change coming out and then changing into a butterfly. 
okay? And it means to change your way of thinking in order to change your way of living. This aligns with the proverb that states in one translation, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. Now, that's a rough but accurate translation of Proverbs 27, 19. Chambers, as I mentioned earlier, uses a powerful, but let's, I'm going to be honest here, it's a difficult text to swallow, but one that we must pay attention to. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Paul says, there is a godly sorrow that brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Praise the Lord and thanks to him for the blessing and gift of repentance, as the Puritans used to call it. You see, apart from Christ, our entire life is going in the wrong direction. We may be nice sometimes. We may do some good things. We may say some good things and have good thoughts. But the Old Testament, remember, was given to us to show us what the standard was of God and His holiness and that we could never reach it on our own because sin had come in and corrupted our nature and we will always turn to that just as Adam and Eve did. Okay? So we're going in the wrong direction, and only as we turn from it, salvation in Christ, Holy Spirit dwelling in us, yesterday's message, right, and His truth, guided by and obedient to His truth, can we truly know that we're saved and walk in it. Remember, the reality of that Old Testament law, again, was that we could never do it on our own. Also remember from yesterday's message that those of us who truly believe have Holy Spirit living in us, which is why we can now choose by faith through grace His leading and our obedience in every situation, align it with His Word every time. Here's the rub and why we must also remember that we still dwell in our flesh and the enemy is still and always at work. The latter part of this same text reminds us, but there is a worldly sorrow that leads only unto death. Repentance as a product and evidence of our faith must be real in us, which is the godly sorrow. And it's shown not only by the great remorse and conviction, but by a genuinely changed life, heart, mind, and life. Worldly sorrow is, on the other hand, not really sorrow at all, but is pretty much, I'm sorry, I got caught, right? And it always leads to, I'll sin again given the chance, and ultimately, as God's word, truth tells us, it leads to death. Chambers begins with a powerful quote in scripture to show us the depth of real repentance. Conviction of sin is one of the rarest things ever to strike us. It brings us to the threshold of a true understanding of God, showing us precisely whom we wrong when we sin. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Psalm 51.4. If you know that, you know that is King's David, King David's psalm of abject remorse and repentance when he had been found out for his adultery with Bathsheba and his murdering of her husband, Uriah the Hittite. Chambers continues, when he comes... He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin. John 16, 8, who's he talking about there? Well, that's Jesus' description. He's in the upper room there again, and he's telling the disciples and apostles and even us today, I, I, when I leave, I will send you the Holy Spirit, and he will convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. We're going to know what those are. The law told us we couldn't keep it, but not only does this, the Holy Spirit convict us of it, it gives us the power to repent and to, over, to, to be forgiven and to overcome. When the Holy Spirit rouses our conscience, Chambers continues, bringing us into the presence of God and showing us that we are in the wrong about sin, what bothers us isn't our relationship with other human beings, but rather our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves you with no regrets. Conviction of sin is so interwoven with the marvel of forgiveness and with holiness that it is only the forgiven person who is the holy person. That's true on a lot of levels, right? The forgiven prove they are forgiven by becoming, by the grace of God, the opposite of Change your way of thinking and therefore your way of living. Turn 180, go the other way, right? The opposite of what they were before. 
That's repentance. And Romans 12, 2 says that we need to be continually aware of and acting along the lines of this great gift in our minds as they are continually renewed and our lives change more and more to be like Christ. The word metanoia means there to be continually being renewed, continually repenting when you miss it or change or, or, or miss the mark. Change your way of thinking over and over until it more and more aligns with God's word. Repentance always brings us to this realization. I have sinned. Confession, along with that, is in the Greek means I, to agree with. It means I agree that I've been doing it according to my truth, which led to sin, and now I'm agreeing with your truth. And, my, and by changing my way of thinking, I change my way of walking and living. The surest sign that God is at work in us is when we say it and mean it. Anything less is simply regret, worldly sorrow for having messed up. The reflex reaction of disgust at ourselves and others for what they might think of us. Sorry I got caught. I'll be more careful next time not to get caught. That's earthly, fleshly sorrow and leads only to death. The entrance into the kingdom is through the pains of repentance. The Holy Spirit produces these pains and sends them. Remember, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, right? And sends them crashing into our respectable goodness. That's apart from Christ, right? We think we're good. Then the Spirit begins to form the Son of God in our lives, transforming their, our lives into something new. Remember from God's Word in yesterday's message that, again, Holy Spirit dwells in you as a believer, as a disciple, if you are a true believer. So this is how you should respond true repentance. The new life manifests itself in conscious repentance and unconscious holiness. Never the other way around. In other words, I think differently and act on it in obedience, and my life becomes by the Holy Spirit nature a constant reflection of His holiness in me. I don't have to think about it. It's what I do now because He's guiding me. I'll let Chambers' final words on this Debo close this out. Food for thought here. Repentance is the bedrock of Christianity. Strictly speaking, we can't choose to repent. If we could have, we, we could have done it in the law, right? Think about that. Repentance is a gift from God, the result of godly sorrow. The Puritans used to pray for the gift of tears or the gift of repentance. If you ever stop knowing the virtue of repentance, you are in darkness. Examine yourself and see if you've forgotten how to be truly godly sorry, a godly sorrow. Don't just be sorry for getting caught, as that leads to death. Be sorry for the sin and know in godly sorrow that lead, know the godly sorrow that leads to true repentance and know in that that you are forgiven and saved. Love and action, spend time with God in His Word, prayer, and listening every day. Number two, ask the Holy Spirit to teach you as you do study. Number three, what does sorrow and repentance look like in your life? Number four, what needs to happen for your remorse and repentance to be godly and therefore life-giving? Tomorrow on The Authority of Love, Wednesdays for Women with co-host Adia Wushner. Don't miss it. Invite family, friends, loved ones, and even your enemies to join us as well. Uh, we'd love to have guests. Thank you. You can contact me again at love and a and love and lordship at gmail.com. Check out the website at love and lordship, love and lordship.com. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks always to the Lord. Make it a great day in the love and lordship of Jesus Christ. 1245 is my good friend Greg Horn and Hope is here. I'm Greg Williams, and you're listening to the Authority of Love.